San Franciscan punk band Green Day released their major label debut album, Dookie, in 1994, they'd no idea what they were letting themselves in for. Within a few short weeks, the album would enter the US charts at the start of what would prove to be a two-year stay, propelling the band on to worldwide sales in excess to date of 30 million. In doing so, they would sell more records than all of the UK 70s punk bands combined. More records than bands like The Clash and The Sex Pistols, by whom they were so obviously influenced. Vocalist Billy Joe Armstrong had said to write songs about his own life, but in doing so, had captured the imagination of the X generation, unwittingly becoming its spokesman and taking his friends, bassist Mike Durnt and drummer Trey Cool on the ride of their lives. Since then, they've maintained their position as the biggest punk band on earth. But their new album, American Idiot, charts new and exciting waters for these school friends from Berkeley. Me and Mike met each other in the, the uh, we were 10 years old in the fifth grade. Uh, and then uh, we just kind of, we are both kind of had the same interest in music and, you know, um, and being, and goofing off and being class clown at the same time. So, um, yeah. You just played together over the course of, uh, you kind of learned how to play together in a lot of ways too. And one thing led to another. Once, you know, eventually we ended up getting into punk rock music and, and in a band at the same time. All the other kids were playing, you know, baseball and football and doing just normal kid stuff. And I don't know, you, you know, our parents were always gone. So we had our guitars and that was something we thought was really cool. And that's, that's just kind of uh, where our focus went. And there was a lot of rebellion in there too. And, and um, I, got into, I got into a lot of trouble that I never got caught for. Growing up together on the streets of Berkeley, Mike had become inseparable from his friend after the death of Billy Joe's dad, renting a room at his house and hanging out together at the Gilman Street Project. Well, we were already kind of in a band, so it was kind of happening at the same time that we started a band, Gilman was happening. Uh, so we ended up, uh, you know, it was just a perfect place to play because we were, you know, 15 years old and it was an all ages place, an all ages place, so, you know, um, you know, it was the, where we could really just kind of hone our skills and, you know, have a good time and meet cool people. Most of the bands that we were first inspired by, I think, were the, the local bands that we were from. You know, I mean, all of, I mean, you know, we we loved, like, all the, you know, we loved, like, The Clash and The Pistols and um, Dead Kennedys and and uh, bands like that that were older than us. But at that, that point, those bands were over. I mean, we, they, you know, our sort of heroes were, weren't really happening anymore. So, and, and punk rock was sort of looked that looked down upon as like as being dead or whatever. So I mean, for us, I mean, and, and you know, being at Gilman Street, it was like, you know, we the, the new heroes were sort of coming out, which, which was like for us was like a band like Operation Ivy or Crimp Shrine, you know, which was you know we were really involved um, and we really come from a strong local local scene. Yeah. So uh, you know, it was, and that's what you know I love about you know being in a band is that you know there's uh, you get influenced by your peers too. Early incarnations of Green Day performed under the name Sweet Children, but the arrival on the scene of drummer Trey Cool in 1989 cemented the lineup. I like to consider Trey as being the original drummer of Green Day. You know, I think we we yeah, went. Yeah. Through. We didn't really become Green Day until until we started really gelling with Trey as a as a three piece and as a band. Yeah. We were never really a band. We were three guys playing together. Then when Trey joined, we became a band. I always thought these guys were great, you know. I always, um, we were playing shows together and like I was in a different band and <clears throat> I was like, those guys can write songs, you know, those guys can fucking sing. In 1990, Green Day signed to local indie label Lookout and over the next two years would release two albums, 1039, Smooth It Out Happy Hours and Kerplunk. They also toured like demons. It was a very independent label and he's he wasn't a get rich quick scheme on anyone's part it's just like hey put we're gonna put your records out and you guys can actually go out on tours and and uh, get your stuff out there and it was more like a uh, like a uh, co-op or, or a socialist thing it was a long it, time it there was. was no distribution beyond like 
the Bay Area, really. Yeah. We'll make records and you can take them with you in a van and go on tour. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Lookout is the ultimate example of word of mouth, you know, yeah. like it's really just start, you know, it's in, and, and, and the thing that was so great about it is that Lookout was, it, it didn't just, it wasn't just about putting out a record, it was putting out several records by several bands that were, you know, part of the scene and um, it's such an under underdog, it's sort of label, it, it never really gets like, you know, like a lot of the New York bands and LA bands get their sort of, their just desserts, but you know, I think uh, Lookout, there's a lot to be said for what, what they did with punk rock, you know. Do you have the time to listen to me while about nothing and everything all at once I am one of those melodramatic fools on me Green Day toured heavily throughout 1990 and 91, but by 92, just as there was a sense that they might have outgrown the Lookout label, a deal with Reprise Records was offered. We were working really, really hard, but we didn't look at it as work because we were, you know, not just an ed education, but we were seeing the world, we were traveling, driving our own van back and forth across the United States and Canada, traveling here in the winter of 91 and playing 64 shows <clears throat> all across Europe and squats and everything. I mean, that's an education and you can't, you know, you can't des describe the smell of a place to somebody. Work was the shit you did before tour to enable you to go on tour. Yeah. We're gonna work really hard not to work. Yeah, you can either work hard to pay to pay rent, or you can work hard to put money into a van that you can call home. Every time that we went on tour, the uh, shows ended up getting bigger and bigger, and it, it, and it started getting to to a point where we were selling more tickets than we were records, you know, and uh, so you know, and then we just had it. That's when we had to start sort of looking at like you know, our options as far as, uh, you know, I mean, you know, how far can we take this? And, you know, I mean, we have this opportunity to, to really, you know, to, you know, to, to, to like live off this band and, and be able to play music for the rest of our lives. So, you know, we were like about 21 years old and, you know, that's when um, we pretty much ended up signing, after Kaplung, we ended up signing to, to Reprise Records. For Green Day to sign to Reprise, however, was no easy thing. To some fans, it smacked of selling out their indie roots. To the band themselves, though, it was a crucial move. At the time, it was a... Uh... It was a decision that we had to make. I mean, it was either that or kind of quit and go get jobs, you know, flipping burgers, which is all fine and dandy, but it's not what we want to do. And we, you know, I think we got, it, it was difficult for us. It was, you know, it's kind of like leaving home again. But, you know, uh, when we look at a lot of our, our uh, you know, our heroes' records and stuff like that, they were all on, on major labels too. And so you, you kind of have to balance the two and make a decision. You know, I would rather, um, Fear of failure is the biggest impedance of success, I think, and, and I would rather uh, die trying. We're always having band practice all the time, so by the time uh, you know we we were signed we were signing to Reprise, I think uh, you know we knew what we wanted to sound like already, and you know we had years you know years of experience, um, and then we were like you know just. You know, we had this song. We knew what we wanted to sound like, and uh, you know, so we had you know the majority of our album written even before we signed the papers. My mouth is dry. Face is numb. is falling out in my room. Ended up getting married and, and having having a kid really young, um, and then my band was taking off at the same time. Like you said, it was like you know we started Lollapalooza and we were this big, and then by the time we were done with Lollapalooza, we were this big, and that was a month. You know, we weren't that, that's not a lot of time, and so uh, you know, I mean, it was uh, you know a really scary time, but you know really exciting at the same time. I think we were swept away by beer for a while. <laughs> uh, well, I think if we just like like kind of kept a the core of the, remember what the catalyst of why we, we want to do this you know um, that's what was really you know important was to you know not get selfish and recognize that we're all three individuals but we're all three individuals coming together for the same reason and to, to play music um, and to have that respect respect for each other too because I think a lot of bands uh, you know, they just get carried away with, with you know, believing their own hype or their own persona, you know. And, uh, you know, I mean, we always definitely, uh, 
make sure that we humiliate each other every once in a while to make sure that we keep each other in check. <laughs> Whatever it was about Dookie, it became the album of Generation X, with songs about boredom, hopelessness, girlfriends and drugs. And with the death of Kurt Cobain, Billy Joe was seen by many as his generation's spokesman. I just had to feel, I feel like I was just this, being a spokesperson for myself and... Um, he said a very loud voice. Yeah, I mean, just try to <laughs> try to write the songs that are uh, meaningful to me and talk about my life. And it's like, and, and you know, if there's other people that may feel disenfranchised that sort of recognize that, then you know, um, that's that's cool. I think I think of it more as like a photograph of that time of Billy's life and that time of all of our lives, really. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a picture in time, and that's um, that's worth a thousand words. Following up a 15 million selling album is never easy. It's hard to write about the streets when you can actually buy a few streets. But 1995's Insomniac was a good record too. I think we wanted to put a record out really fast and, and uh, <clears throat> we you know, wanted to keep in that tradition of putting out records in a fairly short amount of time and being we were pretty pissed off at that point. There was a lot that happened to us and everything. It was really a, a reaction you know, to everything that had catalyzed. I just try to just try to dig deeper into what, you know, what my own frustration um, and my own complications, you know. Um, I kind of like consider that sort of like our, like our, almost like our heavy metal years or something, <laughs> you know. It's, uh, we just like, you know, I mean, it's like that's where we were at at that certain point, you know, I mean, um, you know, I mean, it was just like, it, it, I think things seemed to be, be a bit more bleak than they actually were, you know. Uh, looking back on it, I think I wish I would have enjoyed myself a little bit more. You know, like I said, I'm not, I have no regrets and, you know, Insomniac is a good record, you know. It's like we came up with songs like Geeks Take Breath and, and Brains Do, you know, and uh, which just kind of ended up, you know, being part of like our own evolution. Another turning point, a fork stuck in the road. Time grabs you by the rest, directs you where to go. So make the best of this test and double. Green Day's new album, American Idiot, is going to surprise a lot of people. With punk bands, the question is always, where do you go as the anger subsides and musicianship improves? So how does a concept album with nine minute long songs sound? One day we were screwing around the studio. I mean, I you know we are all away from the studio. Mike wrote a 30-second song and it had like this sort of bombastic vaudeville kind of thing. It was just really and it was really funny and fun. And I was like, oh my god, it almost sounds like a like a part of a rock opera or something like that. And so then I wrote a 30-second piece after that. Then Trey wrote a 30-second piece and we kept like connecting him, you know, because because of technology, you're able to do things like that nowadays. So like so we just kind of kept going. And that song, it, you know, just this arc just started to happen where. It was like it turned into, and actually is the song Homecoming. That's the uh, the, the last 10 minute thing. And uh, you know, we were just laughing and we were having a great time and you know, it was like, this is what we should be doing. You know, this is what's making us feel good. It's not like, I think at that point too, we were just like, if we just, if we have to go out and write a batch of songs and try to pick a single and run, go through the yeah. rules of being in a rock band. You know, it's like you know, I look at bands like like more like Outkast and Eminem as being more um, of an influence nowadays. Yeah. On because it's just like you know, there's so much ambition that's going on in the music, and um, that's I don't know, that's that's where I think rock and roll needs to, to to sort of turn the corner and come back to. I'm not worried about how anybody's going to react. I mean, so far the reaction's been great. You know, it's like the people that have heard it are like, you know, have been like that, you know, really, really like the record. And um, I don't know, I feel really confident that like people are going to, um, as soon as they hear it, they're going to be like, well, this, you know, actually, this is Green Day, you know, and it's maximum Green Day. American Idiot is also going to surprise people in terms of its content. Punk was always supposed to be political. And for Green Day, living in post-September the 11th America was always going to inspire some songs. And a song like American Idiot is sort of based on, I mean, that's me being confused about what it's like to be an American and and what, what, what patriotism is because, you know, it's like, you know, the American patriotism is, is much different than, than, let's say, you know, Ireland, just because it's, America's got this stigma that it walks around with it saying, you know, we're number one, we're the greatest country in the world, and it's just, there's no such thing as the greatest country in the world, you know, and that's where you get, like, you know, and, and it's like, but you get these sort of rednecks 
that or you know or like the you know you know or you have this representative of, of your country your president that goes around acting like a bad tourist you know and, and even worse than that it's like you know it's you know in the war and everything on, on top of that and that for me that doesn't represent who I am yeah. or what I you know it's like I'm just you know I'm 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 a guy in a band I'm an artist and you know it's like I don't I don't want to be represented by some some redneck from Texas I mean people in the media they're supposed to be the checks and balances of every country it's like rock and roll is, is supposed to be about you know rebellion and, and being dangerous you know I'm a firm believer in the church of rock and roll and that's what you know that, and that's what the the rules are that's what it is you know it's the the lack of them you know so you know that's where you know that's what we, we want to challenge people and we you know it's like if people get a bit re resentful or they're yeah. you know pissed off and then we're doing our job then we're doing our job Don't want to be an American idiot. Don't want a nation under the new media